I recently got the opportunity to talk with Nate Staniforth about magic. Here's our conversation. Um, I think the first thing I want to talk about is um, what was your initial inspiration for magic? Because, you know, um, a lot of people, you know, see magicians online or, uh, I mean, it's a different nowadays, but what got you started in magic? Yeah, so it was, it was maybe different for me than a number of people because I grew up in the middle of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And so there weren't really other magicians there. And, you know, it, it sort of seems like, like I loved the experience of magic before I ever even knew about magic tricks, you know. Mm -hmm. I just, I love being amazed by things. And then, um, I don't know if you've ever read the books, The Lord of the Rings, but when I was when I was a kid, I read those books, and I just, like, I really wanted to be able to do actual magic at school. I thought, like, actual spells, you know, right. like, yeah. come from my fingertips. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, so I, I went to the library looking for a book of like, real magic that I could do for people, and it turns out that's not how it works, but... I, <laughs> But I discovered something that was almost as good and, and equally as amazing, which is um, you know, sleight of hand and how to make a coin disappear. And, right. And there's just something about, you know, I don't know, I don't know, in, I've, I've reflected on this. I don't know what it was about the idea of doing something that looked impossible, that appealed to me so much. But, mm. but I just, you know, everyone sort of has their thing. And for some kids, it's sports or music or video games or just for some reason, this clicked with me. Right. And uh, and I you know so I knew from a very early age that that's what I wanted to do. And, and once you know that, you just sort of do it as as much as you can and as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. For sure, that's really cool. Yeah. Um. So like when you were young, you know, just like hey, this is cool, and then figuring out stuff um, with magic books. Uh, right. Did you have like anyone else around you, like friends or family, that did magic? No, I didn't. But but here's the thing. I think that was a tremendous asset because. I was, so I grew up in Ames, Iowa, which is a nice town, you know, it's a, it's a college town, it's a, it was a good place to grow up, but I was the only magician there. Right. And, and so, you know, from a very early age, um, I had to do it all on my own. And this mm -hmm. was before YouTube, you know, that the internet hadn't really taken off. And mm -hmm. so I was just getting books from the public library and, and learning what I could. But because I had never seen a magician, because there aren't a lot of magic shows that come through Ames, Iowa, <laughs> yeah. I had to sort of invent the presentation up myself, you know. And I, you know, a few years later, David Copperfield came through town, and that was one of the greatest nights of my life. Yeah. But, but from the beginning, it was something that I had to sort of figure out on my own, which is a, a tremendous asset, you know, like, because now it's so easy to watch other magicians that I... So I think two things are happening. I think... One, it's far easier to learn magic now than it used to be because mm -hmm. of shows like Scam School or YouTube. You, you know, there's just so many tutorials available, mm -hmm. um, and the amount of good magic that's being invented is is just so much you know, greater than it was when I was starting. Mm -hmm. But the sort of the the bad side of of this is that there are so many magicians putting their work out for everyone to see. That I, I just imagine for a young magician trying to find a unique style, it's it's hard to not just copy everyone else. Uh, yeah, so exactly. I think, I think it's it's easier in some ways now and harder in some ways. Yeah, it, it seems like um, access for sure it has uh, widened uh, greatly just because like you can, again, start learning through Scam School and then find out that there are these magic books or like the Theory 11 website and all this stuff. Yeah, they're great, yep. Um, it seems really cool. I mean, what do you think about like the future of, of magic to go on a little bit of a tangent because now that it's so accessible do you think that there are going to be more magicians coming out with more unique stuff or a lot of just everyone doing the same no it's great magic magic right now is about to explode and, mm -hmm. and so here's here's the way i have this is the way i'm thinking about it now i feel like magic now is where music was in the 50s mm -hmm. because the thing that happened in the the 1950s is that every teenager you know, had access to the Fender Telecaster, which is like this commercially right. available electric guitar. Mm -hmm. And like Bob Dylan had one, Jimi Hendrix had one, Elvis, everybody had one, right? Yeah. And, and it changed, that that piece of technology changed music forever. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like Magic's electric guitar moment was David Blaine's 1997 TV special, Street Magic, right? Because mm -hmm. then it, it sort of took it, you didn't need a million dollars in equipment or staging or lighting rig. All you needed was a deck of cards and something to say. Right. Uh, you know, the electric guitar was invented in the 1930s, but it took, you know, 15 years, 20 years to sort of get into the, the garages and basements of American teenagers. And, 
Yes. And so I think that's what we're seeing now. You know, David Blaine's special, 20 years later, um, finally those ideas have, have reached sort of a critical mass in, in the imagination of the, you know, the, the new generation of magicians. And I'm excited about it. I think, I think we're going to see more people doing more interesting things than ever. <laughs> I'm just glad to be a part of it. Yeah, for sure. That, it's, it's really cool um, to sort of see just, just from the few years that I've been doing magic, just, it's like, it seems like it's blowing up for sure. Um, yeah. It was an interesting parallel there. Uh, just to go back to sort of your, your roots, I guess you could say, yeah. um, do you remember what your first show was, like your first performance? Yeah, uh, I have a video. Uh, I was 11 years old. I was paid $10 <laughs> to perform in a neighbor's birthday party. Mm -hmm. And what, it was terrible. <laughs> what's funny to me looking back on it now is that the, the, the central idea was the same. You know, I, I was performing in the same style that I perform in now. Um, it was just a younger version of myself. So it's strange to go back and watch that. But yeah, it was a, a birthday party for six or seven little kids. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. So, so ever since you started then, you always sort of had that style because um, I know that like watching your magic is always really interesting and it, I feel like it it's... Uh, it's it's like set apart from other magic that I've seen because I feel like a lot of people, um, you know, like scam school or whatever, uh, and yeah. and other like magicians on like Penn and Teller fool us. A yeah. lot of our are cracking jokes and stuff, um, and some people are pretending that it's real. Um, right. But what you do is you're like again you say like I'm not fooling anyone. This is just you're like it's almost you're just presenting something to them in a yeah. more serious attitude, and I think that's it's really interesting to see that. Um, so. Did you have to think a lot, like to come to, to come to that, or was it just sort of? Yeah, natural? I mean, I, I, yes, I think it's been so. So I'm going to say two contradictory things, and I think they're both true. I think the like the center, the the idea of of speaking directly to the audience rather than at them. Like when I watch the video, that's what I see. Trying to you know genuinely communicate with those little kids at the birthday party, mm -hmm. um, but. But, you know, I used to wear a tuxedo on stage and I used to dance around. Like, I, I tried out a lot of things that didn't work for me right, before right. I found really who, who I was and what I was trying to say. And, you know, I think one of the advantages that I had is that because I was the only magician in town from a very early age, like, if the Cub Scouts wanted a magician, I was their guy. You right. know, the bridge club, water, you know, the bank wanted a magician for their, their Christmas party. They, I was the only option. And so I got more stage time, you know, before, even just, like, even before I was a teenager than most people do have access to, you know, in, a, in an environment where there are actual professional magicians that people could hire. Right. Uh, so, so through trial and error, I sort of, found something that worked for me and it wouldn't work for someone else and you know I think mm. I think like one thing that I've learned for certain is that as a performer you you have to be yourself that mm. as, you know if you're trying to be someone else or trying to take something that has worked for someone else you will always look like a fool mm. and I've done that so many times like tried to borrow from Copperfield or Blaine or you know all right. these magicians I admire um, I I have tried everything, and the the only thing that works is when I'm myself, and when I'm saying what I have to say, and right. what no one else would would think to say. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you, you find the thing that no one else is doing yeah. that you you can do, and then it all just sort of comes together. Right. That's um that's really cool. Yeah, I feel like um, as far as the style of magic goes, I feel like it often um, sort of reflects who the person is. You know. Yeah. Um, just sort of how you go about things. Uh, you you were doing shows. You had a lot of access, you know, when you were younger. Um, when did you start doing like college shows and stuff like that? So I I went to college on a theater scholarship because mm -hmm. I thought that studying stagecraft and sort of performance theory would help me be a better magician. And maybe if I had really pursued that, it, it would have. But what I found instead is that. You know, I could perform at frat parties and sorority parties on the weekend, and bars mm -hmm. hire me to come in and do magic for their people. And I had a running show at a sort of gallery space downtown, where like the same audience would come back every other week to see my show. And so, like very early on in, in you know my career as a college student, I I stopped really caring about my classes because I had all these audiences that I wanted to do magic for. Right. And and so that 
like if you can perform for inebriated college students, <laughs> you can perform for anyone on the planet. Like right. it doesn't get harder than that. For sure, yeah. So that, that was an amazing place to learn. Like because it's you know it's one thing like you you do magic you know that you can learn the technique on your own just mm -hmm. sort of sitting and practicing and and you can also you know decide how you feel about the material and come up with your your sort of ideal vision of what a magician should be mm -hmm. on your own like you go for walks or you think about it or you journal or whatever and both of those like you need both of those you can't be a good magician without the ideas and the technique but but the sort of third leg of that stool is being able to communicate that vision and that experience to an audience. Mm -hmm. And unless you can find a way to just grab a hold of the audience, who doesn't care about you or magic, you know, right. everyone's sort of doing their own thing. So you have to find a way to grab the audience and sort of bring them along for the journey. And um, so I learned, you know, far more than anything I was supposed to be studying in college. Learning how to do that mm -hmm. was, was essential because then, you know, my senior year, I, I started traveling around doing magic at other colleges, and I slowly it dawned on me that maybe I could get paid for this. Right. And so when I graduated, I just thought you know it was a fairly easy transition. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so was there ever like um, a time where you thought you had made it, or do you, do you have like a certain like benchmark for yourself that like okay, like I'm a professional magician, like this is it? Um, I, I mean. I would say being able to pay all the bills with magic shows, like mm -hmm. that was a pretty big deal for me, you know, because like when I was in college, I had a, just a desk student worker job to help, you know, go to college. And mm -hmm. um, it was, it was nice not having to do that and just, you know, just make my living as a magician. Right. But I think, you know, that's like the, that's like the minimum barrier for entry as a professional <laughs> magician. Right. No, I mean, I, I think if you talk to anyone who's in this, profession they will tell you that you're always sort of pushing and trying to learn and grow and come up with new ideas and find new ways to perform for an audience and I, um, there's that Bob Dylan line uh, he who is not busy being born is busy dying <laughs> and uh, that that keeps me up at night for sure so, right. so no I don't feel like I've made it yet <laughs> and, uh, you know it's like you, you just you find something that you love doing, and then why not do that as hard as you possibly can? Right, for sure. Um, it's sort of like if you think about a benchmark for, oh, I, I've made it now. Like if you ever sort of reach that and don't have any other goals, it's like, what are you doing now? Like, yeah, exactly. Right. It it, it seems like you kind of have to sort of keep thinking, like, okay, what can I do next? Just trying to push it further. Otherwise, like, what's the point? You know. Um, I agree, and I think. You know, the problem I like I have the opposite problem right now like I have so many projects on the side that I'm really excited about doing and I just don't have enough time in the day to do it so right. it's like finish one thing might as you know just thank goodness there's enough time to bring this other thing in. right exactly um so going through magic and sort of taking this path from just doing it at home or doing it uh, at little places around in your hometown to yes. college and all that. Um, was there ever like a time of discouragement where you thought like, you know what, I don't know if this is for me or like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Um, not, not before I had broken through. So I, I, I toured for five years on the college circuit. And after that five years, I had sort of gotten I don't know if burnt out or disillusioned is like the, here, so here and maybe you can appreciate this because you do magic as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, you get into magic because you love that experience of astonishment and mystery. But mm -hmm. one of the things that happened for me doing you know the same show every night a hundred times a year, like it just it stopped being amazing. Like I stopped. Like I. Like a magic trick isn't amazing when you know the secret. And I had worked really hard for a long time and I felt like I knew all the secrets. And so there was one particularly bad night in Marquette at Marquette University where I walked on stage and it was a beautiful auditorium and it was filled and it should have been like one of the highlights of my career. And I just like halfway through the show, I was like, wow, I'm really bored with this. <laughs> yeah. And I, I stopped the show early and, and I thought, okay, I'm going to quit and go work at Starbucks or something. <laughs> um, but just because the universe is a strange and mysterious place and sometimes amazing things just happen at that time, like on that particular leg of the tour, I had brought a book with me about traditional Indian street magic. 
mm-hmm. and and I, I I went back to the hotel and I had this sort of crazy idea that I would leave you know my my career as a magician I would just put that on hold and I would go to the other side of the world and see what magic in another culture looks like because mm-hmm. um, every culture in the world has its own version of you know the magician right okay. it's sort of archetypal figure and mm-hmm. India has such an amazing tradition of magic that that I I wanted to just sort of disappear and forget everything I knew about being a magician and, and mm-hmm. go to the other side of the world and dream it all up again mm-hmm. and, and so I did that and uh, when I came back I didn't want to work at Starbucks anymore I, <laughs> I wanted to do a lot of magic shows so. wow that's that's really yes. cool um, so you know I feel like uh, in in like the trailer for your tour and stuff you, you talked about um, I feel like you mentioned wonder and yep. also that it should feel like a magic show should feel like jumping out of an airplane. You know, it's not, um, it's this like very unique thing. Um, if you could describe it, what would you say magic means to you? Oh man, that's a huge question. <laughs> but, but let me just, let me approach it this way. So I think, you know, there are a lot of ways to describe your own experience as a human being in the world. And people have used music and poetry and you know literature and film and and conversations and you know that I think for me magic is a way of saying something that I have a hard time saying any other way that I, I feel like is worth saying and or at least worth thinking about and um, you know I, I discovered as a little kid that you can you can give people an experience with a magic trick that that it's just hard to find elsewhere. It's not that you can't find it elsewhere. You know, I think people mm-hmm. find that experience of wonder or, or awe. Um, you know, you can find it in uh, mountaintops or conversations or sunsets or basketball games. Or, you know, you can yeah, find it right. Places, but but you can also find it with magic tricks. Mm-hmm. And and I guess that that's what interests me with magic. It's not like it's not so much the thing itself as what um, magic lets me look at and see and, and notice that, that is important to me. Mm-hmm. So, so magic, you know, the technique of magic or, or you know, the, the craft of the magician is, like I like it because of, of where it allows me to get, not because of, you know, magic tricks are fine, but, but there are a lot of interesting things in the world, you know. But what mm-hmm. I think is amazing about magic tricks is that something as simple as, you know, a coin trick or a card trick mm-hmm. can, can give people this experience that is just you know, electric. Uh, I keep, I'm, you've seen people respond to magic. It's right. It's yeah. yeah. And you know that it's just this little piece of double stick tape that you've hidden on your finger. Uh, right. Yeah. But it, for them, it's this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I've uh, I've seen magic tricks. You know that um, that have been taught to me after I tried looking at it and tried figuring out how it was done. And I, I thought of all these complex ways, like this has to be done this way. It's like, oh, it's got to be like insane. You must need some sort of like, I don't know, uh, makeup or something with this one right. trick. And then uh, I was told the method and it was just dead simple. And, yeah. and I love that in magic where you can do something that is like so simple yet have such an effect. And I feel like it's more about, um, again, like you said, the, the effect it has on people that are watching it rather than the method itself. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, and to me like that, that is sort of the central mystery of, of the magician's craft because here's, so here's just one way of thinking about it. Like, you know, the first piece of magic I learned was how to make a coin disappear. And I bet I put 400 hours. Like I was obsessed with this trick. So I really just worked on it very hard. Had I taken that 400 hours and spent it on some other creative discipline like music or, or drawing, like I don't know, I don't know what 400 hours of drawing lessons gets you. I bet you'd be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But but if you know you you then you know used your skill of 400 hours studying drawing and created something for someone, they might like it. It might be beautiful, but they wouldn't run away, jumping up and down and screaming and, and that yeah. sort of mixture of fear and joy. You know. Mm-hmm. And and I just think like, it's amazing that something as simple as a magic trick can can. Um, create the, the response that it does in people. And I'm fascinated by that. I still can't explain it. It gets more amazing the more I think about it. Because mm-hmm. I know I know they're magic tricks. Right. Yeah, I uh, I feel like I haven't found someone that like 
isn't like amazed or, or has like a positive reaction to magic tricks. And I feel like that's really cool. It just like yeah. it seems like everyone can sort of enjoy that. Um, yeah. 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 No, that's right. It, and you know, one of the cool things about this job is that you get to travel a lot and, mm -hmm. and see that people all over the world respond that way to magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, speaking of uh, traveling, you're on your Real Magic tour right now. Yeah. Um, I think you have a couple of dates left um, for the spring. Two dates left. Yeah, summer break. Yeah. Yep. And then you got summer, and then uh, you're doing more shows in the fall. Right. Um, so if you had to like sum it up for people, what can they expect from your live show? Oh, so so the, let me let me. So it's hard to say what they what it's like to sit there, but but let me just give you the goal. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is to. So I feel like for most people, they have only seen magic. Well, first of all, on a screen, whether it's on YouTube or on TV, or if they have seen it in a theater, it's been grand illusion that that is, you know, maybe you're, you can appreciate it visually, but it might not grab you intellectually or emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I, I love this idea that, um, you know, magic can happen, you know, in, so I'm playing small rooms, 250 seats, excuse me, or so, and with a room that size, even if you're in the back, it's still a really, you know, it's happening basically in your hands. Everyone in the, the room gets to participate. And, you know, I don't, want it, I don't want it to be something that they see so much as something that they feel and experience directly. Mm -hmm. and, and so the whole show is designed in a way to make it feel like, you know, it's interactive and it, and it involves everyone. And mm -hmm. I want them to walk in the way feeling like they have experienced magic rather than just they saw something that was interesting. So, right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, another question about your show. Do you, um, you know, you've been performing for a long time. Um, do you ever find it, like, difficult to come up with, like, new material to put into your show? Or has it, yes. has it mostly, yeah? No, that is, yeah, it's awful. Some magicians love that. I, I'm not one of those magicians. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's important. You know, I do think, especially now, when people can, you know, Google anything like doing original material makes it I guess safer you know that the audience won't just be able to like go buy all the stuff that you used in your show and, <laughs> yeah you know right um, so yeah so I have a notebook of, of impossible things that I want to show an audience that goes back to age 11 Wow and some of that stuff is in the show now um, some of it is like halfway ready some of it I have no idea and I've been adding to it since then you know but, right um, but yeah, yeah, there, you know, I think it would be easier if I did actually have magic powers. But <laughs> For like sure. I, I don't know if you've invented any of your own pieces, but, but like, it's so easy to compromise and to, you know, because you can, you can imagine how you take a, a magic principle that works for one trick and apply it to another trick. But, mm -hmm. but I found, like in my experience, the best pieces that I've come up with are those that have started with a very clear vision of what it should look like, and mm -hmm. then you know you find a method that fits that vision without changing it at all, you know, and it's right. uncompromising and um, miserable, and uh, it's just a lot of banging your head against the wall. Right, for sure. But but the moment we figured out is pretty special. Yeah, definitely. That, that sort of makes it that sort of makes it worth it. And you know, that's I guess like like I'm not naturally the sort of person that that likes to be the center of attention but I I trust my material like I have been to battle with those pieces in my show you know like I know that I can go into any room in the world and if I'm if I've got that show I'll be all right right so, um, so yeah coming up with pieces that can that can fit sort of in that category is I, I like that part awesome um, last question I want to ask is uh, you know if you had a piece of advice to give to yourself when you were younger, uh, learning magic, or just aspiring magicians, uh, what would you say to them? I would say this. I would say um, worry less about, like let's say you want to become the greatest magician in the world mm -hmm. and you're 15. I would say worry less about your career for the next decade. Mm -hmm. just don't, you get there. There's this really sort of time that you won't get back um, as a teenager when you know you you're not ready to be on tour. You're not ready to be on television. And so 
all your only responsibility as a magician is to get as good as you possibly can. So learn your technique, read your theory. Like there are there are certain magic books that I have read so many times that I feel like I have have them memorized. And that started when I was a teenager. You know, mm -hmm. just is you have to internalize these sort of core ideas. And 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 I think you know from like I knew that I wanted to be a, a professional magician, and so even as a teenager was trying to figure out like okay do I need a demo tape or do I need you know how what sort of how do I need to position myself in the industry to make a career out of this and um, I think if I could do that again I would just spend the time that I spent worrying about that learning more magic and right. reading more books and listening to more symphonies and just you know, like part of it's just developing good taste and figuring out in in so many other artistic mediums, like you know, movies and music and literature, like what's good. Why is this? Why does this affect me? And then how can I honor that in my own work? And you know, I, I've learned how to how to attempt that later, but I just wish I had an extra decade, you know, from yeah. the very beginning working on that. For sure, that would be my advice. Don't worry about your career. Um, if if you get good enough, then you'll be ready to solve those problems. Right, exactly. That's really cool. Um, well, thanks for taking the time to talk yeah, to me. Of and, uh, Good luck for you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, one last thing. Where can people find you? You know, uh, if yeah. they want to watch more magic and stuff like that. Sure. So I would send them all to realmagictour.com. Mm -hmm. It's got videos and all the tour dates, and uh, that's that's it for now. So. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much.